pod team is back and rejuvenated after taking some much needed time off for AWP and spring break. Today we've got a brand new episode with Derek Chan of Cornell University's MFA, and in the coming weeks we've got some special episodes that I'm really excited about. But before all of that, I just wanted to recognize that MFA Decision Day, April 15th, is just around the corner. This means many of you will soon be deciding on which offer to accept, if you haven't already, while those on a wait list will find out if a spot has opened up or not. I wish you all the best of luck. I hope you get exactly what you're looking for. But remember, what makes you a writer isn't whether you got into the program you wanted or if you got into any program at all. What makes you a writer is that you write. So no matter what happens this week or over the next two or three years, I hope that you keep writing and keep finding joy in your art. You can find MFA Writers on Instagram and Twitter, as well as MFAWriters.com. We love to hear from listeners, so feel free to shoot us a direct message on one of those platforms, or an email at MFAWritersPodcast at gmail.com. And if you have a minute to rate or review the show, the best place to do that is on Apple Podcasts. Doing so will help boost our podcast as we try to boost these amazing writers. Also, if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show, you can apply at MFAWriters.com. On that same website, you can also click the support button to support us financially, if it's within your means. Or you can do so by going directly to buymeacoffee.com slash MFAWriters. Finally, as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to MFA Writers, the podcast where we talk to creative writing MFA students about their program, their process, and a piece they're working on. I'm your host, Jared McCormick. Today I'm with Derek Chan, a writer and educator from Melbourne, Australia. He holds a first class honors in literary studies from Monash University, where he received the Arthur Brown Thesis Prize. His writing has appeared in journals and anthologies such as Best of Australian Poems, Australian Poetry Anthology, Cordite Poetry Review, Mianjin, The Margins, Juked, and elsewhere. He's been a finalist for awards by Frontier Poetry and Palette Poetry, and he is currently an MFA candidate at Cornell University, where he is an editorial associate for the literary magazine Epic and a university fellow. Today, Derek has brought two poems to read for us. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, so... The first poem I'm going to read is called Bed of Winter. Um, It just references a flower um, known as uh, the Meihua, which translates to plum blossom. Bed of Winter. Pawpaw dreams of glaucoma moon, a white Meihua flowering across alluvial night. She dreams each strand of light, a stemmed grief, stirring the parable of her face. Dreams each eye unhinging like swollen figs, as the walk dark smoulders her deeper into the fever of steamed fish, into the incorporeal salt of ever-dissolving dreams, where some nights she awakens, nestled in the strange grasses of a half-parted world, seeding the soil with her astonishment, as she slow dances amongst Shizandra leaves, as she skips stones like unhoarded decades, as she calls out to her grandchildren gathered on distant plains, the feathery heads aglow, like Meihua's thawing into impossible morning, and sometimes there grows a silence which glistens like apples, the music box of nectar, she cleaves open to fill the aching fermata of her hollowed gums, and sometimes she watches Meihua's sun blossom brutal black beneath the reddening sprig of dusk, and she understands the sea's greyness to be a mirror without the home of its reflection. And all through alluvial night, she digs out the compass of the horizon to etch divinations into the cicatrix of stars, to omen herself into sky, before geographies of sight harden into cataracts of maps, before the slow trains of sleep bear her back through the dark weed of dreams into the shimmering station of this snow-rocked room, of this world she could never part with, where the blankets sculpt her bedlam body into the impermanence of summer frost, 
and the pale plosives of a breath unpetal over her, a white mehua morning, something unspeakably soft. And the second poem I'm going to read、um, is titled Immigration Interview Chinese Exclusion Act 1882. Who paid for your passage? The blood that burned the brightest was always the one we followed. Is there a clock in your father's bedroom? While he slept, silver wheat grew from the sweat of his clothes. The morning found a quiet place to kneel. Is someone forcing you to come here? I don't understand the question. Who were your neighbors? The name Yu Yan, the name Ying Yue, the clouds sliding like Wang Xiu's wet slippers across the hallway. The field, the field inside the finger, the golden doorknobs wrapped in a blanket, the loose joints rattling the ginger jar, the salt in the curve of a pinna, the sound womb glistening the air, the strand of hair lengthening in the spine of a book, the ocean forgetting our names, the sky thirsting for our bodies, our bodies thirsting for the sky, the country, her country, welling in the afterglow. Who paid for your passage? Unable to speak, the dark thawed around us. We held birds like candles. A child mistook the snow for his mother. What direction does the front of your house face? When we were lost, I pulled the curve of moonlight from the wet of his lips into a sickle between my palms. It always spun south. What pieces of furniture were in your living room? The radio, the father inside the radio, the box of chalk. The pocket mirror, the teeth, the jade inside the teeth, the map that shrivels in the moonlight, the wax that blooms in the bone, the chopsticks slid into the holes of coins, the shadows braided on the clothesline, the window that breaks like an eardrum, the wind drawing names in the ashtray, the bayberry bleeding on the tongue, the body thrashing like a blanket in the mouth, the candied ginger goldening on the table, the breasts, her breasts. Swelling ripe in the heat, what is your final destination? Could you please repeat the question? What is your final destination? Where the shadow pauses at the edge of a meadow into the shape of a deer. What is your name? What is your name? Derek, that was great. Thanks for sharing those poems with us, and thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really excited for this. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. So, as listeners will notice from the second poem you read. You sometimes write about Chinese history, the Cultural Revolution, and immigration—things that are not just a curiosity for you, but something that your parents lived through. So, tell us about your mom and dad, their experience, and how that has affected the subject matter of your writing.、Um, yeah, sure. So, I would say、um, it actually really kind of dates back to my grandparents. I would say who really、um, lived through the bulk of it. So,、um, I guess. On my father's side, their family left a bit earlier before it, the things like really kind of set in. So,、um, on my mother's side, I think they I would say that it had a bit more of a kind of difficult kind of、um, journey. My、um, grandmother, she、um, was kind of you know living through that period where there was like kind of the famine setting in, you know, property being seized and. Interestingly enough, during that time, she became one of her villagers, kind of a leader, I guess. And because of that, I my understanding is that she had quite a lot of influence, and she leveraged that influence to kind of get her. She had like around like I think three children at that time, and she leveraged that influence to kind of get them across out of China and into Hong Kong, and、um, which is quite remarkable because like you know、yeah. she was doing it by herself at that time as well because. Um, later on, her husband had to do it in a kind of separate, more roundabout way, where like he had to actually、um, get on one of those boats in the middle of the night and kind of cross the the strait over into the harbor. And that was obviously a very dangerous journey at that time because I remember my dad would tell me like, you know, it it, it wouldn't be uncommon to kind of wake up and kind of see like bodies like washing up on the shore from like kind、mm. of failed kind、wow. of、um, expedition. So like. And it was in Hong Kong that、um, my parents were were born and raised. My mum's side,、um, you know, was quite in a bad kind of socio economic state, like pretty much for most of her life. 
they had a lot of um, she had a lot of siblings at that time, and but and what made it difficult was also the fact that her father passed away when she was quite young. So it was really just my grandma who was just kind of like really powerful figure who was just kind of supporting yeah. like eight children in wow. one go. Um, and so I guess because of that, in it kind of made more sense for um, my mother and her siblings kind of go go straight to work as soon as possible. And um, so she did a lot of like odd jobs. Like growing up, she would kind of work as a, like work in like garbage disposal or she would kind of be in factories kind of, um, I know, I, I remember she told me something about like putting together like plastic flowers in a factory. Um, later on, like she, she did quite well for herself. Like she ended up working in like a first class lounge for like um, Cathay Pacific. And that for her was like really kind of a big deal because how else was she going to like, travel the world and like, experience right. all this stuff that like would have yeah. otherwise been impossible. And um, so I would say like, that's a kind of brief summary of my mother's side. I would say my dad's side um, ended up having a bit more, more like favorable kind of outcome. Like his father um, ended up being you know, quite a good tailor. So he did kind of help put, um, make ends meet. And um, my father, he, he did actually, um, finished high school and wanted to kind of pursue, um, I think science at that time, um, at a kind of, um, university level. And that was how he ended up in Australia. Cause at that time, like the universities there were actually free. And so it kind of made sense to go there. And, um, but kind of like, I think some unfortunate things happened and he ended up kind of being an undocumented citizen, um, for a few years. So that kind of put a halt to his studies and he ended up just having to like kind of do odd jobs kind of um survive and it was essentially my mom she had a flight into australia at some point and apparently my dad's side of family and my mother's side of the family have some kind of ties going back and so just like oh since you're both in australia you know you should both kind of yeah. meet and kind of see what happens and that's how <laughs> i was australian <laughs> <laughs> well you know you mentioned like the difficulties that you know so many people had um immigrating from china during that time like your grandparents time i'm curious if hearing those stories about like seeing bodies in the water that kind of thing if that influences you at all to become a storyteller to try to tell some of those stories yeah um that's a question i've always been thinking about because it's a really difficult one because on the one hand you know, those things have happened. You hear about them and those stories, I guess, in many ways have kind of shaped you as a person, but also because of those events, I'm physically, you know, not in China or not in Hong Kong. Right. I'm, I'm here. Before. So there's a very like clearly kind of like material way in which those stories have affected me. But there's also a really like strong awareness that there's still such a kind of great distance between what I've heard and what I really know and um, whether or not I can really carry any story at all sometimes is what I think to myself. Like, because those things have happened, they've kind of gone. I'm sitting in the aftermath that seems to have kind of affected me in some way. But yeah. also it's like, I don't know all the details. I can't communicate it with my grandparents. Um, and so, I don't know, I think of like what um, one of my supervisors, um, Vojina said, which is like, you know, if, if I speak to the dead, ultimately am I just speaking like to myself um like who am I really speaking to and I think Kim Hae-soon um who wrote um autobiography of death said like writing a poem is like you know being a tomb robber that's robbing my own grave and like I sometimes I feel that kind of sense of like the excavation of storytelling that I'm doing is kind of just like it feels like in some sense it's just kind of like really about myself yeah sure I do believe um, that there is something that is happening and maybe it's because like, I think of history and stories kind of like, you know, being only existing as a kind of like collective kind of consciousness. And so in that sense, history is very like malleable. And maybe, um, what I do when I write a poem isn't so much as like trying to say that, you know, I've preserved or kind of pulled, extracted some history. Maybe it's more to do with like, I'm using the, the malleable nature of history, kind of like cast a ripple and to kind of um, 
show that the past is as divergent as the future and trying to find some kind of um, some sense of like, I know, emotional truth or some sense of um, thinking about history that can be kind of particularized through my specific through specific yeah. experience. Yeah. I mean, for me, like, it really always comes back to empathy, right? I mean, like, you can't directly tell the stories of those people who went through that experience because you didn't go through that experience. But your life has been influenced by them. And through writing, it's like an opportunity to kind of understand what those people went through and empathize with what they went through um, and be grateful for it, right? Yeah, I do think that. And something that was really interesting that I spoke to like Aishin Hutchinson about was, um, you know, the, the fact that, you know, a poet takes something objective and makes it subjective. A historian might take something subjective and try and offer it as objective. Mm. And, and that's a very like, I don't, I think it's like, obviously, you know, that can be contested, but there's some like interesting kernel of truth in that, like the sense of like, when I write a poem, when there's an interesting image an interesting like voice that I feel, it feels almost like something outside of history, something outside of myself that I'm writing a poem that feels like very particularized to a certain time and space, a certain language. But what I'm tapping into often feels like this larger, like peripheral sure. kind of sense. Um, and like, if there is a story that's being carried on, it's it often feels like outside of like what I perceive as a, um, as my own specific experience. It feels like I'm tapping into something that, that's maybe like a broader history of how humans have been moving across the world. So growing up in Australia, you described your relationship to language as a vitally sustaining yet disaffecting experience. You told me that you felt some shame for not knowing English and then later shame for forgetting Cantonese. How do you think this experience has affected your view of and relationship to language? Oh, it was actually like forgetting Mandarin um, later on. But yeah, um, I think like growing up, like language was like obviously a very like sustaining, as I said, because like it was a thing that kind of got me, you know, from primary school to uni because like most of my scholarships, most of my kind of um, funding came from performing well in English exams and English tests. So, you know, I owe so much to the language. But, you know, I remember like growing up, like, being like a bit behind on like my like English acquisition, having like lisping in the in the schoolyard and kind of people pointing that out or being kind of taken out middle of the class to like ESL sessions and kind of just like feeling like I was kind of a sore thumb. It's quite strange because like later on, even when I did kind of become like more, more like well-versed in English, like it's it just becomes a different like marker of difference. Like I just, even like a couple of months ago, I was, in, I was in New York, like at a poetry reading. And like on that night, like three or four people came up and were like, you don't sound like the way you look. Like it was just like a very like bizarre kind of comment um, that, you know, even as you kind of progress, like there is no kind of ultimate kind of way of hiding the dissonance of language from who you are. I mean, do you think that writing, specifically writing poetry is a way to explore and maybe bridge that dissonance? what I think is interesting about like writing is like you have the interior and language is kind of like the closest to materializing that, that interior into this kind of like found object in front of you that you can kind of like mold. And to me, like um, poetry kind of offers not just like, you know, being able to see your interior in front of you, which is like very important because I feel like we don't really know what we think until we see it until we see what we think. Um, but also poetry offers like, um, like an aesthetic kind of force. I often think of aesthetics as like aesthetics as like a force for agency. Like you have the interior in front of you, you have the materials, but aesthetics gives you the shape, gives you the force to shape it. Like whether through prosody or form or image, that's where you're able to kind of like contour like your explorations of identity mm. to kind yeah. of push questions and to even like have things come out and be like why am I saying this like where's this coming from I feel like in that sense like it's offered me um a lot I mean I feel like identity is something that's so amorphous and so ingrained right that like we 
we act in ways that we don't even realize are being affected by our history and by the way that we were brought up. But something about writing and telling a story, yeah, like you said, it's like a way to, like putting it down on paper is a way to make it physical, to see it actually give it shape. Um, and to me, like I do a lot of exploring my upbringing in my writing and I find that I'm able to, to better understand <laughs> why I am the way I am once I've like written a story than if I'm just trying to like think about it. I agree with that because like thinking is just like one part of yourself. There's the actual like embodiment of the self, like the thinking moving with like the emotion moving with the body. And I think like um, poetry to me is kind of like the unity of the being kind of coming together. Like it's not just like your intellect or, or propositional arguments are working it's also like there's your your emotions are making thoughts your thoughts are creating emotion like it's just kind of like strange kind of like debris of movement and the poem i think kind of records and kind of preserves um the living breathing kind of um being through the whole um poem and it's like that's a type of thinking that can't occur in isolation from its parts it's a very kind of freeing and a very like alive sense of thinking, you know, because the poem is like, you know, creating like a new language each time you write it. And it's almost like um, there's like a sanctuary that comes from having a poem that is a one-to-one -one relation to itself that can't be reducible because you're creating images that can't be reduced to anything other than itself. And so like, to me, it's like um, a, it's like standing in like the center of like a hurricane, you know, like where it's like really quiet, but like, the chaos is what protects you at the same time. And again, honoring the mystery of the bewilderment is what, you know, prevents the poem from being like performative or from being like tokenizing because, because, you know, you're not just like, it's not just like you're thinking about a certain subject matter or a certain part of yourself. You're using like the full weight of your being. It's all swirling around this kind of center that is ineffable. And so like it kind of like, yeah, safeguards the poem into a space where like, you you are like constantly like a multiple you are constantly kind of being constructed and deconstructed well let's dig into your writing process and your views on poetry a bit specifically what you call the inherent and inexhaustible mystery of poetry what do you think it is about poetry that is so mysterious and how does this sense of mystery affect your drafting process um yeah that's a good question um i think like I always start with some level of like unconscious kind of material. So that to me is where like the bewilderment comes from, kind of like placing that at the center of the process. And that could begin with, you know, like associative free writing or kind of having three or four different poem poets I'm reading and kind of like having them in front of me simultaneously until like there's a kind of conversation, a kind of like interstitial kind of movement between those poems. And that kind of kind of shunts me into that associative state to kind of start writing. Um, but I do think that, you know, once you have those like unconscious dark materials kind of coming out, you also do need the kind of conscious kind of rain to kind of just kind of direct it because there's a degree, I think, of, you know, just also responsibility of, you know, what you're writing about and not just having it purely kind of like an aesthetic gratification um, and so I kind of see it as like, you know, you're like, you might be like on a little like tugboat in the middle of like a giant storm and like the storm is, you know, ultimately where you want to be, that kind of bewilderment, but you exert a bit of agency by just like moving the rudder a little bit. So you're kind of like still navigating a little bit inside the storm. And I feel like it's that meeting of like the unconscious kind of mediated by the conscious mind as well as that, that kind of is where the poetry happens for me, that kind of meeting, meeting point. Yeah, I actually have this uh, print above my writing desk of a, a ship at night kind of lost at sea, like oh. <laughs> <laughs> the roiling waters. And like, I have it there to remind me when I'm in the drafting process that it is okay to be lost, right? It's okay to just follow the current, if you will, of my writing process. And in fact, I find that being in that state of not knowing is a sign that I'm like on the right track. If I know too much about what I want a story to be about before I start drafting, I find that it comes out quite stale. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, Cause I think ideas can be very like authoritarian in that regard. Like 
it's another way, I guess, of, I, I assume like we can just think about, you know, like communist China, like, you know, when we have ideas that are set in a certain way, when we, there's binaries, when there's dichotomies, you know, that's where um, we feel there's a coercive force in the poem. And for a poem to feel like truly free and to be honest and that we trust, it has to be a poem that, um, you know, sheds all its senses of coercion. And I think the center of that is the bewilderment where like the person and the ego and the ideas are taken out of the equation. Well, before we talk about the MFA program at Cornell and its effect on your writing, I want to talk a bit about your path to the MFA. At one point, you had largely abandoned your literary pursuits for the aim of becoming a clinical psychologist. What influenced that move at the time away from writing? So I think like um, I was trying to, I think through psychology, I was really trying to do the same thing that I was trying to attempt with poetry, but in the kind of opposite way. So like, um, I think ultimately I'm very interested in the interior or in the mind, in something, the kind of the intangible aspects of being in the world, which I think is the heart of our being in the world. Um, and, you know, with psychology, it kind of has like a kind of bottom up approach. So we study the, the matter of the brain and then we try and extrapolate from that into the kind of phen- phenomenological kind of state of of the mind but there's always that kind of like epistemological gap where it's like you can study everything about the material world but it still never really crosses over into explaining this the subjective experience of the world and so like i feel like at some point that just kind of dried up for me because like i couldn't i could i just want to situate myself into the heart of the being and so for me poetry was kind of like the top-down approach where you were in the like phenomena of being of experiencing and from that you kind of I get to situate myself in that center and to write from that place in many ways I feel like poetry is kind of also it it also attempts to cross into the material because I feel like poetry is such an embodied process as well but yeah as to like how and that was essentially why I dropped it but one of the bigger reasons I think that really influenced my shift into um, poetry was near the end of my undergraduate um, studies. I did an introductory to poetry class and I met my mentor there um, who was a MFA graduate from Michigan. And he essentially just showed so much like faith and belief in my writing kind of just made me see myself as a writer. And so he also introduced me to MFA programs, which were just like a really bizarre prospect you know, <laughs> to be paid to write poetry. <laughs> and so I feel like, once that happened, I was like, it just kind of like opened something up in me that was like, I had to try this at least once. Otherwise, I think I would always kind of be regretting it. And so you ended up moving to the States to attend the MFA program at Cornell University, a two year fully funded program with tracks in fiction and poetry. Each year, the program accepts only eight new students, four in each concentration. So it's a pretty small program. I lived abroad for several years and I found that experience to be both difficult and thrilling, sometimes simultaneously. So how are you doing with the transition to the States and Ithaca, New York? Um, yeah, it's been kind of interesting. Like, um, I would say that on the whole, like it's been, um, you know, overall very like um, a pleasant experience. I have had a lot of like solitude to write and like, because, you know, there's pretty much nothing else to do. It's just like a kind of very quaint town surrounded by a lot of waterfalls and kind of hiking trails. So in terms of just like having peace and quiet to write, it definitely has offered me that. But, you know, when I was first in New York City, I was very overwhelmed by like the construction, by the aggression, by like the constant siren. So I feel like the city is definitely like a different beast altogether. I, I, I felt like I had a little bit of like kind of an adjustment kind of period. Um, I think part part of it was because I was kind of going through things before I came here. So I had been through like a breakup just before I left. Um, and that couple with, you know, in the past, you know, I've had like anxiety in the past. And so like, I feel like a lot of things kind of came together. And so I wouldn't, I can't say how much of it is, you know, because of the move here and how much of it is just kind of like the natural kind of process. Um, it kind of came to a head in that kind of winter period when everyone's kind of gone from college town. 
um, everyone is because the whole population here is pretty much like students. So like when everyone's gone, it's so quiet. And I didn't expect that. So like that was another kind of period of isolation that really kind of made me have to do more like tussle with my emotions um, a bit more. So now I'm definitely like once once I got past the first semester, like now I'm in a much better state. I guess another thing though that did kind of occur to me more recently was like um, just like being more aware of the gun violence as well. <laughs> like um, I had heard about it obviously my whole life on, in the media, but being here and then actually like having a situation where like a couple of weeks ago, like I was walking past the street and then like 30 minutes or something an hour later, I came back and it was like all like cordoned off because like there was like a drive by or something. And wow. I think that's very rare, like in Ithaca, but like the fact that I was like in proximity to it, it was like very like unsettling. Um, so I think that was another thing, just like really realizing, oh, this is like, this is real. As I mentioned, Cornell has a small MFA program. So how has that, the size of that program made community building more or less difficult for you? I would say that I have enjoyed the small kind of environment overall. Um, there's really just like a lot of chances to kind of connect, whether it's like, you know, get togethers or like going out for dinner. Um, so I feel like on one hand, it really helps bring people together. Um, I guess on the other hand, I do think, you know, having a larger cohort could also be useful sometimes, I think, because like having more personalities around can often be just like a useful kind of um, thing to jolt your own thinking. But yeah, I haven't really had much problem like settling in here and making friends, but I would still kind of advise, you know, still making effort because it can be, you can, it's easy to become complacent and think that because it's small, you can kind of just kind of drift by and automatically kind of click with people. But I feel like, you know, I still, in the first few months, I would kind of make more of a concerted effort to reach out because um, especially in places like here where it is a bit more isolated that you really want to try and like get your best foot forward when you can to just kind of start building networks before like you end up somewhere in the winter where you're like, you know, feeling very alone. So like, it's good to like set that up early. Right. Well, I think that's good advice for anybody considering an MFA program or graduate school in general, specifically for international students. Do you have any advice for anyone who's considering moving to the States and doing an MFA program? I think like having certain kind of safeguards like kind of put in place early on so like for instance i wish i had started off kind of having more like regular like therapy sessions like through the through the university because like even if you feel like you're high on adrenaline you're feeling very excited and there's not there's, you have like no care in the world like it eventually you know it will catch up when you least expect it to when you when your adrenaline comes down and things kind of crash together so i feel like just having constant check-ins with like professionals, even when you don't believe you need it, um, is something that I would advise because like when you need it, it takes time to set up. And at that point you're kind of, you know, in a pit by yourself. So like, um, also reaching out to people that might be in in years, like far above you, so like third or Mm -hmm. fourth years in this case, because you might, you might like think that, you know, you're too far apart to really communicate, but like there's a lot of, um, really strong kind of networks I've built from that as well. So like really reach in your MFA cohort, like beyond it as well. Like even I've made a lot of friends, you know, just in like elective classes where I feel like it's good to not just be in an echo chamber of like other poets, <laughs> um, you know, to just kind of like open up your thinking. So like the way you network, I think is a really important thing. Well, in theory, a small program should lend itself to having more opportunity for mentorship with faculty. I assume that the faculty to student ratio is pretty good at Cornell. So what's it been like for you building relationships with faculty members? It's been good. Like I would say that it does take like work. Um, It's not going to just kind of be handed to you. I feel like I kind of had that kind of expectation, but I realized, you know, they kind of see us as adults and as like kind of like colleagues. So like to some degree, like you have to like kind of remember that they were very busy. They're always like, they had their own schedules. So like I've just kind of, you know, constantly been making sure that, you know, if some, if a teacher hasn't replied to me by, you know, a week or like a couple of days, I'll just kind of give like a gentle reminder to kind of like reconfirm um, a meeting. So like, I think like don't be afraid of just kind of being shameless 
um, about reaching out because <laughs> that's what you're here for. Right. And I think the professors, when they're there with you, like they're just they're really present, even though they might seem to be kind of very like busy when you're like um, trying to get a hold of them. But like when they're there, they're really present. So I feel like that to me is the most important thing. And there are like there's a lot of opportunities uh, opportunities as well. I think to kind of um, have more kind of like informal kind of meetings with them so it doesn't always have to be like at the office with poems like i've had conversations over like lunch or like over like a walk around a lake and i think that is also an important part because like you want to know them as a person as well and kind of connect with them as a person because they're going going to be the um, gateway to like your future kind of opportunities outside the mfa so it's good to just know them as people and not just as poets how has your class experience been have you enjoyed the workshops in the program we have like a very like I guess like diverse group of people with kind of like their own philosophies. Um, we have like you know people who work well in like sound poetry or like eco poetics, and so like I feel like everyone brings like a very different kind of view to the table. You know, it's every workshop I think will change its dynamics depending on the instructor. So like on my first semester um, with Volgina, like you know she's a very kind of she's from a very like a regimented kind of background, like culturally but also kind of in her own um, practice so like she would encourage us you know write until write, wake up in the morning start writing immediately until you get hungry because hunger is a great motivator <laughs> you know like very kind of like <laughs> um but she like grew up in belarus so you know <laughs> it's understandable <laughs> and um but but i think essentially it's just like take this opportunity to kind of like try and like dive into their philosophy just for that semester and then to extend like the territory of your practice. And then in, in another semester, like go with what the other instructor has. So like I've had the one we have now, like Aisha and he's much more kind of go much more like free flowing, much more kind of conversational. And that's like a very different type of um, play with my work as well. And I feel like, yeah, use this opportunity to kind of like sharpen your own thinking um, and to see where you differ against um, your teachers. As I mentioned earlier, Cornell is a fully funded program, meaning each student gets a stipend and tuition remission in exchange for working in the case of Cornell as an editorial assistant the first year and as a teaching assistant the second. So tell us about the editorial assistantship at Epic. So essentially, we kind of meet in the office. Um, Last semester was twice a week for like six hours in total. Now it's kind of, you know, three hours in office and three hours outside. Um, but I think essentially I would say they're quite flexible as long as you get your quota done. So we just have to read through like a slush pile of submissions and kind of narrow it down over various stages. So it might be like, you know, 500 poetry submissions and we narrow it down to like the last 10 or 20. And then from that last 10 or 20, we sit down with the guest editor and then we kind of have a final conversation about you know, which of the last five that we want. And um, so that's just kind of like takes up the whole semester. And I think another kind of side kind of related project to the Epoch um, assistantship is that we also kind of contribute to the blog. So we might write like a craft essay or we might interview an, a visiting writer and we kind of post it on there. And so that's just kind of like another way of like building um, your, your folio. So, yeah, I think those are the main responsibilities how have you enjoyed that, reading through that slush pile? Have you found that to be beneficial to your own writing? Yeah, um, I definitely had to learn to like articulate and like defend certain pieces and why I liked it. Um, so that was really important. And also just kind of um, being exposed to like a larger range of writing beyond, you know, just very established poets. And because I am able to see, you know, what writing is happening – um, you know, by emerging writers or writers at my kind of age, it kind of helps me kind of like set like a better barometer of like how to read work because like I think it was very confined to like certain kind of um, level only. And so now I feel like I have a greater like kind of instinct or like faith in my own instinct to kind of read a work and then decide on the spot like, you know, is does this have potential um, or not? And I feel like just developing that like belief has been really important for me. And what about the teaching assistantship? What is the teaching load and what kinds of classes do students teach? It's essentially like you teach a first year writing seminar and that is about like, you know, three hours a week in terms of like in class time 
obviously you have to do like outside marking and things like that. And essentially you're teaching like, you know, like writing skills, like basic like composition um, skills. But my understanding is that you're quite, it's quite flexible how you kind of um, frame that approach. So like some of my poet friends, like they would, you know, teach poetry and they would actually have creative writing assignments or like throughout the semester. And like the composition might be kind of like the exegesis in relation to the poems. And so there's a lot, lot of ways to kind of like tweak the way you teach composition and the way you want to teach writing skills. So like it's, you can really turn it into a creative writing workshop to some degree if you wanted to. So I feel like that's quite nice. Um, but there's a really large selection of themes Like you can teach like, um, like, like health humanities or like short stories or like word and image. Um, and so like, they have themes and you kind of just kind of like pick your own texts and your own readings that you want to kind of create your own syllabus within that theme. So you're teaching one class per semester? Yeah, yeah. And how much is the stipend that Cornell pays for MFA students? I believe at the moment I'm getting like close to like 40K a year and they just increased um, the next semester's pay by like 8%. Um, because there was like a, I think there was like a grad school like strike. So, I mean, like that's always helpful, like to have like um, the unions around and um, they do kind of adjust normally like by 4%. So like an 8% is quite nice. And yeah, I I think from all the programs I applied to, like this was quite up there, like quite equivalent to like the other really well-paying ones, like in a Missioner or Vanderbilt. And they also include uh, student health insurance at Cornell, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you only have to pay for dental and vision, but that's like 200 a year. And you told me before the interview that there are some lesser known funding and teaching opportunities. Could you tell us about those? Um, Cornell has this kind of like strong connection with like surrounding like prisons. And so we actually read submissions from them, but we can also like teach in those prisons. And so that kind of gives like, you know, you can do that over the summer or you can like kind of add that into your existing load. And I think, I don't, I think it's somewhere around like, you know, for like three months, it might be like $3,000 um, stipend. And it seems like a quite a good experience. And other like opportunities are like, you can do, um, you can sign up to be like a reading, like assistant for like another professor. And you just kind of take notes on the class. You help kind of mitigate some, some of the marking loads. And that I think also pays quite well. It could be like up to like 6,000 a semester. There's also like the emergency, like student funds at Cornell. So like um, you can get upwards of like 1,000 over each semester where it's like, if you need help getting like winter coats or like laptop repairs or like the you know, toiletries. So like, that's another thing that, you know, um, to make a use of. And I think the other one I can think of, oh yeah, um, the travel grants. So like travel grants, they have um, travel grants. They can apply for every year, like a couple of them. Like the one that you can normally get if you're like a graduate student is like upwards of 1000. And so you can just kind of like give a project proposal saying like you need to I think one of my friends is like wrote that you no, know, she wants to go to Mexico to f- see the biggest tree, widest tree in the world, because you know she's running like an eco poetics kind of book. So like that's a really easy way to kind of just <laughs> go to <laughs> a like, quick trip. trip to Mexico. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and it's also like some classes, like the um, Urban Justice Lab, which is what I'm taking at the moment. It's like you essentially just get paid to enroll in that class because like you get money to kind of make an exhibition. And it's quite a large sum of the money. Like I could think like 1,500 I got um, this semester and like, you don't have to use all of it. You can pocket the rest. And so like there's just classes that they have like a extra, they can secure the bag by taking a class, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's good to know and, and good for anyone who's considering Cornell to keep in mind that there might be ways to make even more on top of that stipend, which is already a, a strong stipend. And then after you graduate from the program, which is two years long, Cornell also offers a lectureship to students. Can you tell us about that lectureship? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's an optional um, kind of situation. And even though um, technically, like you still have to apply for it, but essentially like, no one has ever, you know, not been accepted for it if they want, if they want it. And it's just like a, you can, t- it's up to two years. So what you do is just like you, t- you teach, 
you know, just like another like composition kind of class, like kind of like the same as the first um, year writing seminar. But then you also take another one, you teach another class that's just creative writing. So that's like a really like focused um, poetry or fiction like workshop that you run. And you just teach those two classes um, each semester. And that just kind of happens um, for those two years that you're there. And also during those two years, you can also um, still like audit or like take a graded class out of your own interest. Like you have like one free class that you can do each semester. And like some people might use use that to kind of, if they want to do like a PhD program and then want like certain training or certain like background, then they might use that time to kind of like pad up the resume or um, degree. Yeah. Okay, so essentially the MFA program in which you're taking classes and you're doing the editorial assistantship and the teaching assistantship, that takes two years. But then you have the option after you finish for two more years to continue teaching those classes and you still essentially get paid that same stipend. Yeah, um, I believe, I'm not sure what the stipend is going to be now because I have heard some things about it being increased because you're, you're going to be like a lecturer essentially. So like it might, I know it won't be lower than what you have currently, but this potentially might be higher. Well, before we go, I want to give you the last word. And this is a question I ask all of my guests. What is one way in which the MFA experience has been different for better or for worse from your expectations when applying? I would say when I came, I was like really like just like nervous about like the amount of rigor that would be in the program and like whether or not I was kind of, you know, well situated to handle that. Um, I had this idea that, you know, we will all be sitting in like workshops, like, um, you know, everyone would just kind of be like super intense, like staring at each other across the table and like, you know, having to kind of like make sure everything I say is like super like, super like smart sounding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and what I realized is like, you know, it's very like relaxed. It's very, very like a, it's an environment where I realized, you know, we're all like very much beginners still. Like, er, like we're always putting out poems that are, you know, nowhere near finished, but you know, that's, that's not something that um, is expected of us, you know, to write poems at like a certain level. And I feel like I realize now that, you know, after coming out, if I wanted to graduate from the MFA program, it's really just like, all I am is just like someone who has more, has produced more work, but it's not that, you know, I've suddenly found the secret of, of, you know, craft or I've suddenly understood like how to make the perfect metaphor. It's still very much like the beginning of an apprenticeship and like the apprenticeship goes on for like, I think like 40, 50 years (laughs) <laughs> according to some people. So I think I'll write my first poem when I'm 80, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been really awesome talking to you, getting to know you. Thanks for sharing your poetry with us and thanks for taking the time to chat with me. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. This was super fun. And yeah, it was a really wonderful conversation. Thank you. <laughs>